Yes, fantastic. So 1 p.m. in Edmonton. For those of you who are joining us uh, for the first time, this is a second installment in the discussion forum organized by the Cool Folklore Center focusing on archiving during pandemic Ukrainian heritage collections in Canada. In particular, we are now in panel two. It is a round table and discussion titled Community Archiving, Where to Go for Help. Uh, my name is Natalia Kanenko Friesen. I am uh, Friesen. I am a Wutzelak Chair of Ukrainian Culture and Ethnography at the University of Alberta in the Department of Modern Languages and Cultural Studies. I also wear a hat of the Director of Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies. Uh, my role today is to moderate this event, to introduce everybody. We have three speakers. First, I'd like to remind everybody that we are gathering in the Treaty 6 territory, the traditional land of many, many Indigenous peoples, and uh, we like to acknowledge that during our meetings. We are to proceed uh, with three speakers today, as I've pointed out, and those are Bogdana Bashuk, Andriy Savchuk, Marina Chernyavska. So I'll introduce everybody uh, first. Then we will spend about 10 minutes, each of our presenters will spend on um, uh, discussing their points they wanted to bring up during this conversation today. And then I'll take the privilege uh, of being a moderator and I'll introduce a few questions to the speakers. Uh, we hope to spend no more than half an hour uh, on that second round of our exchange. And then we're gonna open up the uh, floor for the questions from the audience. Uh, Ashley Halka Audley is going to help me to uh, navigate through that uh, list of questions and we will use the documents you'll be providing as well as we will be monitoring the chat group. Um, what I wanted to add before we go forward, Marina and myself, when we were discussing the focus of this particular panel, thought uh, that it would be good to uh, bring up the discussion somewhat to that conceptual interesting level which would focus on um, intricate relationship between community and professional archives. As you know, our participants in the second session are not necessarily representatives of community archives at all. Uh, so, um, and the questions which we will be addressing will, will steer us hopefully into that direction uh, uh, to reflect on that relationship between professionalism and community-based work when it comes down to promoting, archiving, and sustaining Ukrainian archival heritage. All right, so our presenters are Bogdana Bashuk. Uh, Bogdana stepped in the position of executive director of the Shevchenko Foundation uh, very recently in July 2019. Uh, she brings into this position 15 years of senior experience in the nonprofit sector in the areas of culture and heritage. She's noted for her work in both television and radio broadcasting and has worked in the areas of culture and heritage, serving in senior management in Os at Osiredok Ukrainian Cultural and Educational Center in Winnipeg. In 2013, she joined the Shevchenko Foundation management team. Um, welcome, Bogdana. Next presenter, you. You. <laughs> next presenter is Andriy Savchuk, who is actually representing the library uh, or is the archivist at the Library and Archives of Canada. Andriy is originally from St. Catharines, but he has lived in the nation's capital, Ottawa, for the last 17 years of his life. He's been very active in Ukrainian Canadian community since childhood and has always been, uh, had an interest in Ukrainian and Canadian history. His academic background, background includes a BA in art history and archeology span from Brock University, then MA in art history and museum studies from the State University of New York at Buffalo. His, he has worked at various museums and galleries in Ontario and New York, as well as being an assistant to several cabinet ministers on Parliament Hill for almost a decade. As I've mentioned, Andri is an archivist in, at Library and Archives in Canada. Welcome, Andri. Okay. Marina is coming back into this session now as a presenter, and she will be representing uh, Bogdan Medvitsky Ukrainian Folklore Archives. She's an archivist at Cool Folklore Center, and uh, she is also responsible for a number of initiatives 
and uh, at, at both at Kolk Folklore Center and in Bogdan Medvedsky's Ukrainian Folklore Archives, specifically looking after the archives operations and um, various research projects which take place within this institution. And I understand, Marina, you are uh, the initiator of the SUCH network uh, to, um, to launch, which was recently, um, yet again, uh, not, was recently launched, but they could, it recently they have been um, informed of its existence again. Anyhow, Marina administers the provincial archival database Alberta on record for the Archive Society of Alberta. Marina has a master's of arts degree in Ukrainian folklore and the Masters of Art Library and Information Science Studies. She's an active member of the Ukrainian community in Edmonton and of the international archival community. She is, as I mentioned, the initiator and lead on the Sustainable Ukrainian Canadian Heritage Project. Thank you, Marina, for joining this panel in the capacity of the presenter. So I am now opening up the floor for uh, Bogdana to introduce her points for the conversation today. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, before I begin, I want to very much acknowledge the incredible work of our Ukrainian Canadian Museum and archival organizations uh, who work with limited or without any professional staff in some cases, with a modicum of resources to maintain, catalog, preserve and manage the collections under their care for the benefit of us all. Having worked 10 years in the heritage sector at Osaradov Ukrainian Cultural Center in Winnipeg, I know firsthand the day-to-day -day challenges and the fiscal challenges faced by our archives and museum community. For the small handful of our larger archival museum institu institutions, uh, such as Osaradok, uh, who have the benefit of some professional staff or a combination of administrative and professional staff, finding significant operational funding support may be somewhat easier than for those who run smaller operations entirely by volunteers. The bigger institutions are likely to access more varied sources of funding, including municipal, provincial, and federal government programs. Size, however, does not matter to the Shochanko Foundation. No matter what the level of staff professionalism or the level of administrative expertise, whether you have a big building or a small room, three shelves of archival documents or 300, all have the opportunity to approach the Shochanko Foundation for funding assistance. For those of you who are not familiar with the foundation, uh, since 1963, the Shochenko Foundation has financially supported Ukrainian Canadian communities in uh, four areas or pillars of endeavor arts, education, community development, and heritage. The Shochenko Foundation Heritage Program is intended to ensure that the history of the Ukrainian community in Canada is sustained and that the important sources of Ukrainian Canadian history and life are not lost for future generations. We do this by inviting those organizations and individuals who are engaged in the preservation of Ukrainian Canadian history uh, to submit applications for funding assistance for their projects in areas identified by the Shochenko Foundation over the years as being the primary activities of heritage uh, of the heritage community. Exhibits and related projects being the main one, that's exhibitions and events related to the display of archival materials and artifacts related to Ukrainian life in Canada. Collections management for heritage institutions. This is uh, for not-for-profit, semi-professional and amateur groups governed by a board of directors or similar body responsible for the group. The funding in this program supports collections management, that is conservation supplies, environmental monitoring controls, software, costs associated with cataloging, professional development and collections management, and other similar things. And then the third area that we've identified is acquisitions. This is uh, funding for acquisition of heritage items that are significant to the history of Ukrainians in Canada and which may be at risk. 
in the last 10 years, since 2010, the Shevchenko Foundation has allocated to over a half a million dollars for projects in the heritage pillar. The overall total funding assistance for the heritage sector is admittedly smaller in relation to funding assistance allocated to arts, education, and community development. For example, in the last fiscal year, 2019-2020, we allocated almost a half a million dollars to 89 projects, and of these 89, only three were in the heritage sector, totaling $19,000. These projects were exhibition related for preservation of collections and for online museum. Why so few? We just don't get a large number of applications for heritage projects, and there's no clear understanding why that is. Earlier, I said that the size of your archival or museum operation does not matter to the Shotanko Foundation when we consider applications for funding assistance, but do know that the Foundation follows strict eligibility criteria and has expectations of your grant application uh, to tell us what you want to do, how you want to do it, how much money you need, and who's going to be responsible for it. You must carefully consider your needs and confirm that those needs match our criteria and eligibility. And if so, then you're encouraged to apply for funding. So to further answer the question, where to go for help, the Shochenko Foundation is one of those places. We have two application deadlines per year, April the 1st and October the 1st. All our eligibility criteria and application forms are online at uh, shevchenkofoundation.com. And just a quick, you know, sort of thing on, on COVID. Those heritage institutions, museums that rely to any degree on public programming to sustain their work may be facing some financial trouble. We recognize this and we're aware of this. The Shotanko Foundation can't bring people to your door, but we encourage you to look for ways to bring the public to your collections and archives in other ways, virtually, for instance. The Foundation also encourages you to consider introspective work, the kind of work that COVID now allows you the time to do. Consider holding strategic planning sessions with your board and staff. Spend time, usually spent on giving workshops and tours, on managing your collections, cataloging new acquisitions, deaccessioning on needed items, cleaning, sorting, etc. Reach out to other similar organizations, institutions to determine whether there are some costs related to collections management that could be shared, such as the pur purchase of uh, shareable equipment, supplies in bulk, etc. The Shevchenko Foundation's heritage program can be of assistance to you with some of these projects. In closing, I understand your challenges in the day-to-day -day preservation of management of our history. I also understand the responsibility you and your organizations carry in doing so. The archives and collections that tell the story of the Ukrainian experience in Canada are not yours alone. By virtue of their provenance and their substance, they belong to us all and therefore are a concern to us all. Diakun. Thank you. Thank you, Bogdana. Um, we are now moving on to the next presenter, uh, Andriu. Uh, would you please join us? Sure. Thank you. Uh, I believe you can hear me well. So, uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak with you about how we can continue to save our Ukrainian Canadian heritage and history. I have been very fortunate to work for Library and Archives Canada on their Ukrainian language collections for the last three years. In my short time there, I have learned so much. I am by no means an expert archivist, but as an avid enthusiast on Ukrainian Canadian history, I believe in saving our past so that future researchers can piece together a broader picture of our heritage. In the short time at archives, I have stumbled upon countless documents that researchers have not yet seen and made public. Correspondence letters signed by well-known individuals, photographs that left me dumbfounded, radio transcripts that were only recorded live, but at least saved in paper form. The knowledge is just waiting to be discovered. The archival evidence saved now will avoid having mis and dis information being disseminated with this backing of hard textual facts, provided that the finding aids are done well, well enough uh, to find that information for future researchers. Over the decades, many focused individuals in our communities have been able to put together and place phone or collections in private or public and even academic archives, 
Hopefully the documents and other housed evidence is safe, easily located, well-preserved, and have quick access for the researcher. This does not mean a, pack on the back, a pat on the back for us and that our work is finished with X amount of collections of individuals and organizations across Canada. Collecting archives is an ever ongoing project, uh, even struggle, since a heritage is only as rich as the facts that back it. If a box ends up at the dump, we may have lost colorful life stories intermingled with politics, war, intrigue, and a piece to a missing puzzle in our community. History will then be rewritten without those truths. I'm speaking to you on behalf of the National Archives Committee that was recently set up through the last Congress held in Ottawa in November of 2019 by the umbrella organization, Ukrainian Canadian Congress, the UCC. Our volunteer committee wants to bring archives forward and with it factual information that may clarify or enlighten us further on an aspect of our past. With a handful of dedicated volunteers, including Marena, uh, Irena, Bohdan, Andrew, Miron, and myself, our committee is there to give advice on anything archives related. Where can I turn to? What is this? Why should I keep that? What should I do? Is this important? We can help. When an organization shutters its doors or an active community leader passes away, where does the evidence of this life work end up? Hopefully not in the trash, but in a spare bedroom, an attic, or a dark dry basement in bankers boxes, basically not too badly organized by topic and or date. That would be ideal as a preliminary destination, but that knowledge would be better shared. That is where our committee comes in. Even if an organization, association, or group is not closing down, but would like to ensure proper long-term housing to all the old minutes, projects, programs, memberships, and photos that they have, this can be donated to archives incrementally. Perhaps in a few years, further additions or accruals can be made, but the aim is to safeguard what is there and to not get it lost. There are many ways of doing this. Our committee is there to help out in giving good guidance. Should it go to a municipal or provincial archive? Should it go to a private or university archive? Or does it have a national significance to be shelved in the nation's vaults at Library and Archives Canada? A primary and good example of giving simple advice is what to use. Acid-free folders, use pencils, no stickers, or metal paper clips, and use standardized bankers boxes. Also sorting by similar topics in chrono chronological order. These tips and tricks could save time and hassle for potential donors and will be appreciated by the accepting institutions. This will be more appealing to archivists in accepting boxes that already have been organized and easily understood on what the contents are. As Marina mentioned, papirchike. Our committee's aim is to raise awareness about the importance of preserving our documentary heritage. We understand that sometimes people have a hard time uh, keeping up with the present and the future of an organization, let alone of all of its past. Our committee is working on distributing surveys to member organizations of the UCC that outline all the important aspects of archiving, basically like a health check on archiving. Uh, it is even good practice to start organizing ahead, of course, methodically, so that documents are already ready to go if the opportunity presents itself to send off to the archival vaults. Please check out the ucc.ca website that has a page on our committee. And you can also reach out to us at archives at ucc.ca. Again, archives at ucc.ca. We'll be more than happy to discuss any of your questions or concerns. Perhaps you know of those organizations or even about those boxes. If so, please send that information our way. We'll be able to help. Uh, so soon we will also uh, hopefully have a Q&A section, helpful tips, bulletins, and examples of what people need guidance on when it comes to archiving all on our site. On top of this, we are also exploring a wish list idea of sharing information to the public about existing Ukrainian Canadian archives and their collections and where they can be found. So thank you for hearing me out and uh, 
I guess we'll leave it to Marina now. Thanks. Indeed, Marina, you'd be next. Thank you, Andrew, so much. Thank you. Uh, hello again, everyone. Um, I would like to share with you an initiative of the Cool Folklore Center that started uh, about three years ago now uh, that we named a Sustainable Ukrainian Canadian Heritage. Uh, it's a broad, uh, I think this name can include a lot. We are focusing on archives and archiving now, but uh, we specifically chose heritage, not archives for the name of the program because we believe that other aspects of heritage also um, are in crisis and they need help and they need to be um, addressed. Uh, can people hear me? I have a note, note that my connection is not stable. All good? Okay. So I would briefly talk about the program generally, but I would like to focus more specifically on uh, um, one aspect of this program, which is a national archival database for Ukrainian Canadian uh, collections. So I will share my screen now and we'll walk you through as I'm talking. Can you see the website? Yes. Okay. Yep. So uh, just two days ago, you may have received an email and I realized there were many emails in the last few days. Uh, but I would like to uh, say it again that the Cool Focal Center is very pleased to launch uh, an archival database, Sustainable Ukrainian Canadian Heritage. Uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, financial support from Peter Rapchuk uh, Endowment Fund that made this work and many other initiatives uh, for this project possible, um, including today's event. Uh, so I would just show you briefly, we'll go back to uh, the top a tiny bit later, but I would like to start from here. Um, as you see, there are several links in the footer under resources. I would just like to uh, briefly mention a few of them. Uh, for example, education. Uh, we plan to offer um, professional training to community archivists within this uh, project. We are planning, we have the first one planned for uh, October uh, of this year. And it's just an introduction to archives for people who uh, haven't been trained but uh, take care of uh, archival collections on a daily basis. Uh, you can see the description and because of COVID, this uh, will happen online. Uh, although we were hoping to do it in person to start with. Uh, after this introductory course, we are hoping to attract different um, experts in different fields because archival field is really uh, broad and uh, people uh, who are experts in conservation, for example, in digital preservation, in description, in different um, aspects of archival process. So uh, you are welcome to uh, join if you're interested. Um, another page I would like to highlight is uh, we will be, uh, we are offering uh, community archives grants. Uh, they are, uh, they aim to support projects that uh, describe archival collections or people who would like to attend an archival uh, course uh, that is offered to uh, as a professional development and also to purchase archival supplies if it's part of the archival project that they're working on. Uh, there are, uh, we tried to make the application process as easy as possible. You can uh, see most of the information here. And if you have any questions, please reach out. Um, there are other links that you can go to and uh, check it out. On the right side of the screen, uh, some of you are subscribed to such network listserv and you've been receiving uh, information about other grants that are available to community archives, about educational initiatives, about different um, achievements that uh, community archives had, uh, like successful projects or exhibitions and things like that. So you are welcome to subscribe if you haven't yet. Uh, we do not send too many emails. I think it's once a month, it's, uh, two twice a month, I think at the most, but sometimes it's just once a month. 
uh, you are welcome uh, to do that, to keep in touch. I also encourage all the subscribers to uh, ask questions through the listserv because uh, sometimes um, we can have a shared expertise and you may know something that I don't. And having this network of people who are in the same field who face very similar problems daily, I think it's incredibly valuable and to be able to ask those questions in a friendly group is important. So if you have, I don't know, if you're thinking, what's the best um, standard to digitize VHS cassettes? Or um, where do I find, does any, I actually asked this question. I, uh, I ended up with a film uh, of, um, sorry, I don't remember now exactly what it was, but I, I was sure that a copy of this is in all archives and I reached out and nobody had it uh, because I thought it's just a person who gave it to me found it on a dumpster basically. Uh, so I was sure I can just ignore it, but I wanted to, uh, to check first if anyone else has it. Apparently national archives, uh, all bigger archives and smaller institutions that I talked to, nobody has it. So we will uh, try to find uh, resources to digitize that film because uh, the condition is fine, but uh, it's still deteriorating. So things like that, you and people are encouraged to do that. Uh, now I would like to draw your attention. There are three uh, boxes in here. Ask the archivist is uh, uh, the idea that if you have a professional question, a question about archiving, you can always ask there are many resources available for different kinds of institutions. And um, sometimes it's just knowing that information that helps. We are uh, happy to help. I mentioned grants already, and this one on the right, join us for free. Um, this is to become part of the network, to have your pen here on the map, to be able to apply for grants and to contribute to the database. And this is the main thing that I would like to share with you. Uh, one second, I have to move. Okay, so here on top of the screen, um, this website is basically the database. All the other information is supplementary, it's complementary, it's not really the main purpose. The main purpose is the database. It is based on archival software uh, called Access to Memory, and it's meant for archival descriptions. So it supports professional uh, archival standards, um, national archival standard, the Canadian national archival standard, international archival standard, as well as other standards that are more user-friendly, I'd say. Um, this database has just launched, so it's not filled with uh, information, but we hope that it will be extremely useful, especially for those community organizations who do not have resources to have online presence and to have their archival descriptions available online. So uh, I can click through some of these uh, to show you how things will work, but currently there is not much. There is, there is information in archival institutions, so if you click on it, there are different institutions that you can um, click on and see. It's a general information about the institution and about their holdings. Uh, you can always click on our beautiful logo to go back home. So in the future, the same will be possible for archival descriptions. Uh, these will represent separate bong or collections. And it is also possible to have even uh, descriptions on the item level and images attached to them, video, audio, this database supports it all. Creators is uh, another big part of archival description. So as you all know, you always want to know uh, how material was created, who was the person, the family or organization that created it uh, and circumstances and context of uh, creation of those records. So this will be also here. I like to think of this as some kind of encyclopedia of Ukrainian Canadians in a way, because you can, uh, you will be able to click on it and see uh, a short biographical note about this or other person. Uh, also uh, subject uh, terms or keywords can be assigned to all archival descriptions. So if a person doesn't really know what to, uh, they are searching for, they can uh, click on subjects and pick from browse subjects and pick from what they're looking for. And also if someone is looking on for uh, materials only with digital objects, 
images, text, audio, video, they will be able to do so clicking by here. There is a search bar here. It's a simple search. There is also advanced search where you can search by specific institution or by specific collection. And it's a very sophisticated uh, search. It, it works really well. Uh, I would also like to say that uh, this type of databases, they're indexed by Google very, very well. So that when you search for something, and when I know that it's in, um, in a similar database, it comes up in the first three uh, search results. So it's, it's really a robust uh, database. Uh, how am I doing on time? I think I'm basically done. So this is the idea. And the last, but mostly, I think it's a very important thing to say, uh, currently we invite uh, community organizations who take care of archives, like heritage repositories, to contribute their descriptions. Uh, also, community organizations who are not a repository, but who would like to preserve their own archival, institutional archives, we are happy to help those too, and they can have their own page and their own descriptions in this database. In the future, uh, we hope to provide training how to use the database. And here on top right of the screen, as you see, there is a login button. So this database allows every organization to have their own account and to be able to log in and contribute their own uh, descriptions. Uh, when uh, the part of big part of this project is sustainability and it's in the name. So idea is that of course, no single institution can do it for all the Ukrainian Canadian organizations, but if each organization can contribute their part, it will be more sustainable into the future. And the Peter Adopchuk Endowment Fund that uh, supports this will support the technical side of it, the back end of it, so that the database is there. There is a server space that keeps it running and going. So this is the idea. Oh, and I forgot another thing, just last thing. There is a language button, so potentially you can have it in Ukrainian as well. But I think we will start with English uh, first. So yes, that's our uh, initiative. I welcome any questions you might have, and I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. Um, thank you, Marina. I, as I said, I, I'll take upon it myself first to run by, by uh, the presenters a couple of questions which are being edited as we speak. Um, first of all, let me review very briefly who we what, what we were just presented with. We You see, in one uh, being uh, saving Ukrainian heritage, uh, uh, our sustain sustainable Ukrainian Canadian heritage project. Um, both organizations represented by Marina and Andri, I understand uh, your efforts are really directed in expanding and building capacity uh, 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 coming down to the archival work across the nation in Ukrainian communities. And yet, um, Bogdana is mentioning that out of 89 applications, there are only three uh, recently which has come uh, to, to, to support archival work. My question is about the audience and, and organizations, you, uh, the Marinas and, um, and these are, uh, organizations are working with. How far you, uh, how large is the uh, audience, your audience, and what we can do, what you can do to make sure there would be more applications coming into Shichenko Foundation next summer, or next, next round of competition. Maybe Andri, maybe Marina, and then we will see whether Bogdana has something to comment. Sure. Uh, with Library and Archives, of course, we are, like, we represent every uh, ethnic group in Canada as much as we can. And the Ukrainian one is a unique one. Of course, uh, during the multicultural years, uh, when it was a big push, we had all sorts of different uh, communities coming forward and giving their, uh, their collections. Uh, one example right now, which is really important, is the, the Belarus one. Uh, we do have the uh, Belarus Canadian uh, Association. And the reason why it's important to have that is because what's happening right now in Belarus. So the same applied to what happened in uh, uh, Ukraine. This isn't actually applying uh, to your question. I will get back to it. Uh, but with the, uh, what, how would I say, the disinformation, misinformation, what can be spun one way? Well, there is truth 
in what is safe, uh, saved and safeguarded in our collections. So that's why it's very important to keep this, uh, these collections. Uh, as our audience, we have people coming in from Ukraine, re researchers who are looking for certain, let's say, arts, culture, even some political. Uh, they'll find certain things, surprising things in our collection because we are such a, a vast uh, institute. But uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Marina? Marina, I think uh, uh, Andri is passing on the torch to you now. Oh, yes, sorry. Uh, Natalia, I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry. Could you please uh, repeat what, what exactly you're asking? Um, you are uh, representing a, now a network of mm -hmm. a sustainable Ukrainian Canadian Heritage Project, and Andri is also representing the UCC uh, National Archives Committee. Um, how effectively, how far, uh, how, how, may, how much you have reached out? How, what are your audiences? Who are you, the communities, the organizations you've already established the connection with you, you've already supported? Who are those institutions and, and how can we all make sure that um, the archival, I was just putting it in the form mm -hmm. of how can we make sure that there would be more projects uh, uh, offered run so the Shevchenko Foundation will receive not just three applications to support archival projects across the nation but more. So what is, what is the, uh, you know, who are you working with and, and how are you increasing the capacity here? Thank you, Natalia. I think it's a it's a wonderful question and also a problematic issue. Uh, when we reached out to organize a, a conference two years ago, we succeeded in many ways, but we also failed in many ways because after the conference, which was a success, people kept uh, phoning or meeting us and saying, why didn't I know about it? So there is an issue and we reached out through all our channels. Uh, I think that today for this second event within the such um, project, uh, we were able to reach further, uh, partially because of those connections established at the conference. So it kind of, it's rolling and it's getting there, but there is a lot of work to do. So now we have a person from New Brunswick, who knew? Uh, so I think these, it takes time to build relationships. It takes effort to nurture those relationships. So I think we have progress, but there is a lot to be done. Uh, this is also another reason and changing my hats here, why I'm a co-chair with Andri on this UCC National Archives mm -hmm. Committee, because I think UCC has this reach. They have a responsibility to Ukrainian Canadian community to support them, but they don't really have capacity. It's just two people, right? And, and a lot of volunteers. So I was hoping that it also will help us connect uh, with people in different provinces and different cities in people uh, in places that we that maybe some organizations are not active uh, that active in Ukraine Canadian community we would also like to support organizations that are not part of UCC that are more marginal we would still like to support them because it is a Ukraine Canadian heritage anyway even if it's not the mainstream Ukrainian Canadian heritage. So I think it is interesting, valuable, and it has to be preserved. So we are happy to help here and lots to do. So Bogdana, I just, as, as a follow up on this and a comment, as you were speaking, I was thinking maybe we should organize a session for those who are interested in applying for the grant and just get together people like today in Zoom and just go through very practical questions and very practical stages of this uh, process. So people maybe need help. Maybe they're intimidated by the application process. I don't know. So maybe we can work on that. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. And, and not just applications to the Shotanko Foundation, but I think applications in general, because funding is available, you know, from a, from a multitude of sources. And with the organizations and institutions represented by this group this afternoon, surely, uh, you know, we could put together a list of, of those sorts of, of, of possibilities. Uh, and, you know, with the help of uh, Andri and his committee, and then work towards doing a presentation where we could help people, you know, uh, uh, you know, get through some of these logistics. Absolutely a great idea. 
Thank you so much for addressing this question. And I'm very happy to hear, Marina, that uh, this is potentially an outcome of this very gathering today. Uh, this, in a way, brings us back to a bigger question altogether. Uh, you know, going forward, we do live in a digital world. We realize that physical objects and uh, physical documents are um, disappearing through our uh, in the context of our new work practices. So the archival work appears to be even more relevant in today's uh, context. Uh, and yet, uh, we're still probably struggling in, with how to enhance and how to support the uh, the work archival work in Ukrainian Canadian con context and communities across Canada across the nation. So how, what, what would you see as, uh, as representatives of your organization as being most immediate needs uh, when it comes down to sustaining and supporting community archival work? And uh, maybe we can ask uh, uh, Bogdana first, because you were the first, maybe Andrea and then Marina, since it was the order with which we began. No, I, 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 I need a little time to think on this one. <laughs> right. No problem. Marina. Yeah, I can take it. I can, I can, I can improvise, I guess. Um, I think the easiest answer would be we need money or people need money, but I don't think it's uh, the right answer. Uh, from my experience being engaged in many archival initiatives, uh, specifically in Ukrainian communities, but also uh, in other communities, I think lack of an awareness is the biggest issue. People uh, don't always understand um, the importance of archives, uh, like is, in the first panel, it was mentioned that people throw away things that are valuable, or Andri mentioned it as well. So this is one thing. The second thing, people confuse libraries, archives, and museums because they're all they're known as memory institutions, right? So, in it, and the question of convergence of these three is a big debate nowadays. But it's not about that. It's about the way archives work. They work differently than libraries and museums. So describing archives, arranging archives, uh, it works totally different than cataloging museum artifacts or cataloging library. Mm -hmm. uh, I think people need to know more. And also, uh, this is why the idea to name this session where to go for help, because I think there are resources, there are answers. It's just a matter of connecting, and this is why this is a network. It's a matter of connecting the right person who knows the answer with the one who has the question, with, with the uh, agency that has granting money and someone who is seeking uh, the support. So I think this is the biggest. Thank you. Yes, uh, with Library and Archives Canada, we are a big institute. So when it comes to uh, someone who wants to uh, get some information, it doesn't go directly to me, it goes to reference. So there's a, an actual section that handles that. And of course, there is the process uh, for Library and Archives Canada where you have to apply to get a card. So therefore, they get your information on who you are, what would you like. And of course, most of our finding aids are online, uh, whether they be uh, very easily searchable or uh, through a PDF on uh, old, um, uh, just like a Word doc. But uh, one thing that we have tried to do to make sure that there's more outreach is we have a, a program called DigiLab. And basically what it is, whenever there's a researcher who comes in, they can actually digitize that information that they're looking at for the uh, Library and Archives Canada and they'll, they'll put it up on the website. It's just because we don't have the man hours or, or the resources to do so much what we have. So if someone finds something, there may be an interest in it for someone else. And uh, so that way we can get some obscure documents out there faster for everyone to see. Bogdana, is there anything you Well, uh, you know, when I, when I think about some of these things, the, the, the kind of the primary, um, you know, Marina brought up a, a, a very good one, you know, the, the notion of awareness, awareness being the basis of everything. If people are aware of, of what an archives is, if people in the archives world or in the collections museum are aware of, of what is out there, then we can possibly lift lift uh, kind of the concerns that some of us do have about the future of collections. We can, we can lift them up. Um, I, I think awareness and money are probably the key 
to, to, to the future of, of, of our collections and, and our archives. I can't say that, that I or even the foundation I, I, I work for has all the answers, but surely on a fundamental level, um, we understand that those are the two, the two critical things and, and putting resources into awareness, putting resources into finding funding, um, into agreeing that that's something we need to, to, to support collectively will, will take us a little further. Maybe not right. as yeah. far as we want to go, but at least a little further. Right. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. I, I, we have touched upon a little bit on that important question of the future of Ukrainian archival heritage in Canada. I, I do believe it is a big question, and Bogdana, you've, you've already pointed out, of, of, uh, or, or at least briefly spoke to that, um, is, is if, you know, we, we are moving into this new world with, with digitization being really one of the driving um, kinds of uh, practices moving forward uh, with this being in mind and, and understanding how costly that if we can imagine ourselves in it, uh, going forward what would be the most uh, what are the challenges that might be uh, the the most daring in ch uh, uh, going forward with our with the Ukrainian heritage archiving work in Canada um, and I think it's more of a question to the archivist right now. And I'd like you to think, of, well, I myself, not that I'd like you to think, but I myself thinking about the, indeed, that dramatic switch, you know, in, in terms of technologies that we've faced, if we've faced recently over the last you know, decade or so. And remembering that archive, community archives are, are probably in, in need of uh, assistance or, uh, or further expertise on that. So what are those challenges going forward when it comes to Ukrainian heritage in our archival heritage? I could start, if I may. Marina, yeah. um, I agree that uh, now living in a digital age, everything changed. Everything is different and every action in archives related to archives has to account for this new reality. Mm -hmm. However, uh, I would also like to mention that uh, for archives, not everything needs to be online. Mm -hmm. Not everything you would want to be online. Archives are, there is a lot of joy in archives, but there is a lot of trauma in archives and a lot of sensitivity. And sometimes you don't want that to be digitized and publicly available. What I think is the answer, and yes, digital is the way forward, especially because our country is so huge and traveling from one archives to another is an issue. I think that the future is having all the descriptions online of every collection, every phone, every material that uh, a repository owns so that people know. And if a person knows whether that person lives in Ukraine or in Ottawa, they can uh, request it and access it. Technology allows access, even if it's not publicly available. We, uh, I recently got a request for uh, a video how to make it symbolic and we uh, we cannot publish it pu uh, publicly due to uh, restrictions in a donor agreement but we can provide access to it to researchers and a person comes from far across the country so i think this kind of approach would be a likely answer than um, than just digitizing everything and putting it up online as would be uh, possible for uh, library materials, for example, because it is already in a public, not in a public domain, but it's publicly available, right? If a book was published, you can go buy it, you can go access it in the library. So mm -hmm. it's a different story. Yeah. Thank you. Andrea, maybe I you. Do, yes, I do agree with uh, Marina about uh, robust finding aids, descript, uh, descriptions. This way people know where something is. Uh, the, um, the one thing about digitization, <coughs> train of thought. Um, gee, maybe if you could go, I'll just I'll remember what I had to say. 
I, I, when it comes to issues of digitization, you know, I've been away from the, from the, from the field for a very long time. I defer to all of you. Uh, I mean, you are the experts to one degree or another on, 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 you know, whether this is, whether this is a, a good thing, an expensive thing, an inexpensive thing, or that kind of thing. I can, I can steer you to the Shevchenko Foundation for financial help for it, but I can't speak to it. Mm -hmm. um. Can I add something? Of course. I think it's a very important. Uh, when people think of digitization, they think it will solve all the problems. In fact, having digitized material or born digital material creates many more problems. Imagine you have to preserve a box of papers. You can realistically preserve that box for decades and decades and maybe a hundred years. If you have a hard drive with files that you received 20, well, okay, 20 years ago, we didn't have hard drives, but some years ago, it's not a given that you can open those files today if you didn't do anything. So digitization, it's just such a small step. And I know that many granting agencies support digitization, but very often agencies, even agencies don't ask what's the long-term plan what's the sustainable plan of what you're going to do with this digital data in the future. You are stuck with terabytes of information. What, how do you care about it? You know, digital files can rot. Bits, zeros and ones disappear. And you have to keep checking. You have to keep converting formats so that uh, the old Word document that you were able to open 20 years ago, you can still open it today and provide you know, information to exactly the same material as you received it. So there are so many complex issues that just start with digitization. I just wanted to mention. Well, thank you, Marina. That does open up a Pandora's box, of, obviously, when it comes down to, to, to this new technology and new practical way of moving forward. Um, I wonder if you have questions to each other before we would move on to the audience-based questions. I liked, for example, I'd like to maybe tease you a little bit more about that potential collaboration between the Such and Shevchenko Foundation when it comes down to, uh, in, to promoting and inspire, in, encouraging people to apply for, for funds and, and perhaps offering some training sessions. Uh, I think Shevchenko Foundation can definitely play a role here. Um, again, I want to stress that, that we understand the importance of, of archival and museum collections. And, you know, many, many of us have, have informally expressed some concern about the future of, of museum collections and archives, understanding that, that, that many of them, particularly the smaller community-based ones, uh, some organizational ones, organizational ones are in the hands of people who are going to be leaving us very soon. What's going to happen to those things? What's going to happen to those stories which, which collectively make up the history of us as, as, as a community? So being aware of that and sort of in the first kind of stages of conversations and discussions about that, we welcome uh, your expertise and your concerns. And we look forward to, to sort of having, um, uh, you know, further discussions with you so that you tell us, you tell the Shevchenko Foundation where we can help you the most. Um, we can't make it up. We are not the professionals. So we are, uh, we hope that you as a community collectively would, and, and particularly through the, the, the such network, which I think, by the way, is fantastic. It was to give bravo to you. Um, I, I think that, that the onus is on you to, to, to consider what your, what your needs are and how the communities can help you, how the Shulchenko Foundation can help you, how the UCC can help you, and, and, and steer us in the direction that you want us to go to help you, to get there. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Marina Andriou. Uh, Bogdana, uh, I would like to thank you. Uh, you, you said, and archives, and this is an archivist speaking, using archives as a singular but in plural. This is <laughs> very, yeah, very... Yeah, yeah, me. Yeah, I, yeah, I, know. Yeah, yeah. I know. You know how I feel. <laughs> and <laughs> really. I but uh, yeah. aside from that, uh, 
I think personal connections are important. I think being able Very to speak with you guys, even virtually, but to see your faces, mm -hmm. to see, uh, to understand you better, understand your beliefs, understand your value systems, I think it will also help us move forward because all big things happen because of personalities. So I think we can do some. And if I may just offer a, a small comment about the future that I keep thinking about, I think some years from now, uh, it will look different than today, Ukraine Canadian uh, Archival Heritage. And specifically, I would like to say that some organizations will decide that uh, archival process is not for them, it's too much. And they will donate it to bigger archival repositories like the National mm -hmm. Archives, if it's a national uh, organization, or, or to provincial archives, to university archives, those who have capacity, have resources. However, I believe there will be other organizations who decide that they want to be stewards of their heritage and they want to take care of it. And I don't think one approach is better than the other or one is worse than the other. I think both are valid. And I think we can help uh, to direct the first kind to what repository is the best uh, fitting for this type of material. And in the second case, we can help with resources and with information. So that's all from me. Thank you. All right, and you? One thing about uh, the digitization, I'll tell you that the private side is much smaller than the government side in Library and Archives Canada. And one of the biggest projects right now is uh, working on the past prime minister's uh, collection. And of course, that was one of the, how many years that it was digital. And so the digitization process is so massive. Uh, it's they've got, I forget how many archivists working full time and it'll be on for how many years uh, to make sure that goes in our archives correctly. And so that's one of our projects, I guess, for uh, the UCC uh, Archives Committee is to train or not train, but give as much insight as we can to organizations right now on how to format your digital archives. Uh, so therefore it doesn't just come in as a mess with you know, emails and folders, but have them think long-term, oh, if this gets archived, how will it be, be done? So uh, I think that's one of the other projects that's very pertinent in, in the future for, for us. All right, thank you so much. Uh, let's maybe uh, see how many questions, and we do have a few questions, are coming from the audience. I'm going to, um, read them as they have been presented to me here. Uh, thank you very much, the presenters, for your thoughts and your reflections. I'm sure that we can take this conversation further with the help of these questions from the audience. But this one is from uh, Natalie Kononenko for Andriy. Uh, Andriy, do you know what happened to the papers of the Labour Temple in Winnipeg? Very specific question. Yes, uh, I am working at Library and Archives, and uh, a lot of the Ukrainian stuff was. Uh, stopped because nobody could read the Ukrainian. Uh, the person before that retired in the early 2000s, and of course everyone is familiar with Meron Momrik. Now, even Meron is retired, he is still very active in the communities doing all sorts of projects. And he did visit uh, in Winnipeg uh, the organization, and the, uh, they still have the paperwork, and so all the boxes are still there. Uh, so it's kind of in a holding pattern. So, but Meron, he's, he's on top of it. So things are, are um, in negotiation still, I suppose. So they're, they're, they're safe in Winnipeg for now. Here's this Natalka. Um, thank you, Andrea. So uh, the next question comes from Alana and uh, it focuses on the um, application. And, I, and there's a mention, I'll just try to make sense of this here. When it comes down to heritage applications, maybe the problem is, is that only 15% of costs are covered by the scholarship. Um, I'm not specifically sure what is being referred to, but I understand. I think I, think I know, I think I know what, what's being Perfect. said here. And, and, and you know, uh, uh, if I'm, Oleno, if I'm, if I'm wrong, uh, please correct me, but I think it has to do with the fact that with the Shevchenko Foundation grant applications, only 50% of the costs are considered for funding of the total, of the total budget. So I think that's, that's what, uh, what the reference is to. As for why it is that way, that's the way the, the, the applications were built and that's uh, that's just the way how they are in in all of the pillars. The Shevchenko Foundation considers uh, 
uh, funding of up to 50% of the total budget cost. Thank you, thank you. Um, next question is for Bogdana. Dear Bogdana, I have a question for you. The most of funding opportunities offered by the Shevchenko Foundation are only accessible for permanent residents and citizens of Canada. The question is why they are not accessible for, for the scholars holding citizenships of other countries, for example, of Ukraine, but are working on Ukrainian Canadian topics. And alternatively, would you be interested in seeing proposals submitted by these who don't hold Canadian citizenship, but work on the project that is based on our cutting of Ukrainian Canadian culture and corresponds with the philosophy of the Shuchenko Foundation that comes from Olga Zaitseva Harris? Okay, so the mandate of the Shuchenko Foundation is to support Ukrainian Canadian. Uh, uh, community, cultural, heritage, and education endeavor. That is our mandate. We cannot support uh, um, uh, people who are not, or organizations that are not uh, Canadian. That's that's just the way the way the the, the whole charitable uh, situation has been has been built for the Shevchenko Foundation. I am intrigued, however, with the second part of the of the question, the last question. Would would you be interested in seeing proposals submitted to those who don't hold Canadian citizenship but work on a project that based uh, on a Ukrainian Canadian subject matter or or culture? The way to do that, the way to get around that, we would not be able, obviously, to support you know that kind of scholar or that kind of scholarship directly or that kind of project directly. However, if that person or if that organization partners with a Canadian organization, then we would be able to consider it for 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 funding. It has to have a Canadian component. It has to be a Canadian citizen. Well, but there's workarounds. That clarifies it. Thank you again. Um, Next comes from our own Andri Chernevich. Uh, congratulations to Marina and her team for creating an online platform and expanding the network. And workshops is a great idea. I wonder if you are considering a limited number of bursaries to cover the cost uh, for the workshop. I imagine it would be much appreciated by small volunteer-run organizations. Uh, thank you, Andri, for the question. Uh, and for your kind words, uh, and the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, we, the cost is not high uh, at, uh, already, but we have uh, discounts or even waivers for students uh, or seniors or those who are in need and cannot afford financially to do that. So absolutely yes. Thank you for asking. Thank you. Um, Marika Dubek is curious here. I think that if there was an outreach person who could reach out to each UCC member organization to help them with, our, with archiving. Many organizations are run by senior, senior volunteers who do not have current skills uh, to do this themselves. Also, this outreach person would help the Ukrainian community organizations to apply for grants for archiving, gain as senior, senior, senior seniors and not, are not able to do this themselves. What uh, we can reflect on uh, in response to Marika. Andy, can you take yeah, it? Yeah, sure, that is a, a good idea. Uh, one thing that we are working for is uh, the survey. And the survey will be uh, a multi-page, uh, how many questions uh, for an organization to check out on their, as I mentioned, archi archival health. So to see how are they organizing, uh, are they thinking ahead? Where do they plan on doing this? So we, we do have that in mind. And actually, after the survey, we were thinking of even reaching out to them. We don't want to do cold calls and say, hey, you don't know me, but so but give them more of a I hope you had a chance to look at the survey. Uh, are you considering on uh, saving your, your information? So we'd actually make an outreach uh, effort in that uh, in, in our project. With the uh, grants, I'm not sure about uh, that, but uh, we can uh, explore that. Yeah, I would just like to add that, uh, uh, thank you, Andri, that uh, we decided the survey will go out uh, online and it will be shared as a link in UCC bulletin in their email out, but Andri offered kindly to actually sit down at the phone and call people who may not be checking their emails or may not have an email and offer 
uh, to mail them and survey as a paper form or help them answer those questions over the phone. So thank you, Andri, for this initiative because I'm sure there are people like that. And for the grants, uh, we are volunteers in this capacity as well at the UCC Archives Committee. And we all have daytime jobs and sometimes two and other responsibilities. I'm not sure we can do work for other people, but we are trying to help as much as we can. Thanks, Marino. Um, Natalie Kononenko is wondering, and it's a question for everybody here. Many collections of material are currently in digital form, coming back to the question of digital materials. The policy of most institutions is not to accept a digital archive if it is already housed in another institution. It seems to me that having a backup at another institution would be a good idea for the sake of safety. Digital materials are quite ephemeral, as, as um, Natalka points out here. Marina, Andriou. I can take that. Um, and I addressed this question a little bit uh, already. Uh, if an institution takes the responsibility of uh, preserving certain material, and we are speaking digital in this, in this case, they are doing all the preservation work. And it's a long chain of actions that have to happen with these digital files every day, every week with a certain regularity. Uh, another hardcore rule for all archives is, uh, there is an acronym and I forgot it, multiple copies keep archives safe or something like that. Sorry, it doesn't come uh, to me right now. But uh, a good uh, practice is always to keep three geographically distant copies. So if there is a fire in one place, uh, then another backup copy, a copy is available. So there are so many complex procedures in place that and it costs so much that it doesn't make for more than one institution to be doing that there is just too much material and enough to preserve we cannot afford to duplicate that quite positively okay. um thank you uh larissa sembaluk jladin is checking in with us here as well thank you to the presenters for an engaging session my question comes for, uh, from bogdana's mentioning uh regarding the aging guardians of our heritage has anyone initiated a project to record the knowledge of our senior slash retired archivists before their insights are no longer available? For example, Sonia Kachur, Nadia Sinsar, Bogdan Medvitsky. Any takers? Uh, well, I will have to change my hats again, but uh, some of you know that I'm working on my uh, doctoral program at the moment that uh, is dealing with community archives. So thank you, Larissa, for idea. I was uh, planning, I'm not at the research stage yet, I'm still taking courses, but it's, uh, it's a very good idea. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Natalie Kononenko, again, uh, we're again going back to the idea of digital materials. Marina has stressed how ephemeral digital collections are. How about those collections that are entirely in digital form? How do we ensure that they get maintained? Uh, depends what we are talking about. Um, I, uh, I was approached by, let's imagine, a community organization that wants to preserve their archives and they ask for advice. Sometimes it's a good idea to, uh, for example, print their minutes because, well, minutes is usually uh, one of, type of types of documents that is preserved because a small community organization definitely doesn't have capacity to uh, do digital preservation. Uh, to be honest, Provincial Archives of Alberta, is, as you may know or may not know, is a very large institution with good resources, with a lot of professional stuff, uh, even an institution of that scale, they do not have a good digital preservation uh, strategy in place because we are not there yet. Things are changing every day and we don't have all the answers, even if people are professionals and work in professional environment. So there are all the decisions, they're all temporary decisions. And we are hoping that within five years, it's gonna be preserved. But then five years from now, it will be a totally different uh, present and we will face different challenges. So I think, I think it's a very complex answer. <laughs> I yeah. hope it helps a little bit. 
Yeah, but thank you so much. It's, it's again, it reminds us how, how we need to be adjusted in our work as we go forward when it comes down to dealing with new yeah, forms. Yeah, yeah. And again, or just, just uh, I'm sorry, Natalia, I just quick, oh, no, if, if we're thinking, that, so the minutes is one example, but another example when preserving digital is a way to go, for example, a collection of oral uh, interviews, mm -hmm. for example, connect, uh, collected by uh, Dr. Khan Nemko, if, uh, if a person is affiliated with academic institution, there is usually a possibility to partner with library, uh, with the university library, which uh, Natalka did, of course, and in that way, they are responsible for that. So if the library accepts a collection, they take care of it. We may not know it on the front end, but they do take care of it in the back end. Thank you. Um, I, this one would be probably for, I think for Andri, and again, <laughs> Natalie Kononenka is asking, does Library and Archives Canada have a plan for migrating digital archives from current formats to new ones? It's an important it, question. Yes, yeah. With yeah. Uh, Library and Archives Canada, they do have a, uh, a digitization uh, program. It, it's, they're still working on it, of course. Uh, one of the buildings that we're, uh, a building in Gatno, it's called Gatno 2. It's a massive uh, carbon neutral building and it's going to be, I think finished 2023. And it will be all for digitization, but I'm not sure about how much we can get from the all the paper documents into the dig digitized form. I mean, it's just, you have so much, I shouldn't say backlog, but there's so much uh, out there that uh, is, uh, is needed. Uh, so, <laughs> Resources, uh, human hours, it's, uh, it's a major project. Thank so, uh, you. The answer is I'm not sure. <laughs> um, I wonder, Natalka Kononenko, I wonder if you would like to, uh, wait, Natalka continues asking a few questions, if you would like to check in um, with your own voice and ask those questions. I just uh, unmuted myself. No, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the issues with digital databases is as the programming behind them changes, something that works beautifully in say 2018 may not work so beautifully in 2022. So that's what I was asking about, um, was the migration from one program to the next. And the other thing is, you know, Marina mentioned fires, but there are all sorts of things that can go wrong with digital databases which makes me seem that the Canadian policy of storing at one institution and one institution only may be, especially because uh, digital archives take no physical space, and because we are now sharing things like the programming behind digital databases, that it might not be a bad thing to have things in more than one location. I know that some things are on Compute Canada, but even Compute, Can well, well, let's say with something like Compute Canada, unless I keep applying to Compute Canada, my stuff goes bye-bye. My stuff is quite voluminous. And so, have, as I said, having it in more than one location maintained by more than one set of archivists seems like something that would be a very good idea. Andrew? Yeah, financially, I think that's uh, difficult, especially on the government side. Uh, I, again, I, I relate to the uh, Prime Minister's collection, the archivists, when they're working on the digital uh, collection, it is actually a terminal. So none of that is accessed. Like those computers are completely blocked uh, from the internet. So right now, once everything will be compiled and the collection is, is done, then they'll have some sort of gateway to uh, the archives, but I mean, I, I see that as perhaps the, the future where uh, they'll have uh, these, these gateway door, doors uh, that will allow uh, researchers to get, gain access. But otherwise, I mean, you're right about the technology, 2018, 2020, 2022. I mean, I, I think in five years, who knows what kind of AI uh, archivists uh, there may be out there. 
All right, thank you. Um, a few more questions are coming our way. Can I, can I answer? I'm sorry, can I step in and answer that? Yeah, that is perfect. Uh, Natalka asked specifically about programs, about software, and I didn't realize it first time. So there is specific software for digital preservations, uh, digital preservation, and I realized that a per when a person builds a website or a custom database, it grows old very fast. However, if uh, the database is built specifically for digital preservation, it has built-in mechanisms for that constant file conversion, for updates, for all these things. And there are two ways to go, uh, depending on the available resources. So one way is if you have your own IT person, there is a lot of open source software that works perfectly well. Uh, if you have your own server and IT person, you can do it yourself. You download free software, you take care of all the backups and all these processes. Another way is to pay the third party to do that because there are specific agencies. Uh, Preservica is one of them, for example, who take care of digital preservation for you, but you have to pay them money. So these are two things. Uh, the, the, another one about physical space, I just wanted to mention that servers do take space. And there are a lot. There is a lot of concern nowadays in archival community about uh, environmental imprint of servers because we think of digital data as something ephemeral, but in fact, it does take space. It does create a lot of heat. So there are a lot of issues related to that. And about Compute Canada, I totally agree. I'm in the same boat. We have over 200 terabytes of space with them now. But first, it's uh, accessible only to researchers, so it's only for university folks. And second one, they partnered with Portage, I don't know if you've heard, it's also a national infrastructure, to actually take care of the preservation part. Because Compute Canada, what they're doing, they're supporting current projects, a lot of compute power, a lot of processing that is happening right now. They don't care what's gonna happen 10 years down the road. And then they finally realized, because from people like you and me who come and worry that it is still available sometime down the road, uh, so they developed a strategy and I can email you a link. Uh, they just announced it maybe last month or so, I can forward it to you, thank you. Thank you, Marina. Coming back to a couple of questions here on my list. Uh, Andriy Chernevich bring, is bringing up a very uh, good point. A question from Marina and Andriy. Are you aware of any effort to inventory Ukrainian materials in municipal regional archives throughout Canada? There was an initiative once upon a time by Irina Matias, I do remember that as well, under the framework of Ukrainian Canadiana, which has resulted in the publication of a very substantial reference uh, material. Is there something of this sort that is ongoing? Andriy Chernevich was asking. I, I'm not familiar with anything of the sort. Uh, but have you heard? Uh, well, my hope is that such network database will, uh, it is, it will be based on Matasha's work, but it will grow from there because uh, it is changing so fast. Some organizations stop existing some collections are being transferred to a different repository, some new archives uh, appear. So I think that having it as a digital database will allow us to keep it up to date, preserving information that used to exist, and then updating it as we go. So I, uh, I don't think there is a point of publishing something like 800 page volume uh, that Archivno Ukrainik of Kanadi is. Although I do keep it on my desk, it is a very good resource. But we are planning to make it first, uh, information from it accessible in English to people who cannot read Ukrainian, but also to continue regularly updating and adding to it. But we need to approach those, and especially Andrei, you're right, those smaller municipal and town and church organizations, uh, we need to go out and my hope was for this year to actually travel, buy a pass for a train in Canada and travel through all the communities and do presentations in all small communities. Didn't happen, and you know why. But it's fantastic you're bringing it up that you actually have been planning to, to yeah. um, do And Bohdana knows about that, yeah. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, Larissa Sembaluk Shladin follows up. How common is it to ask donors of digital information to also contribute funds that would help process and maintain the files and continued uh, preservation of digital files? Question to the archivists. 
Uh, it's when, not uncommon uh, for uh, even Library and Archives Canada if there is a donation to be made for, let's say, an organization uh, that is one of the checklists on the donor's uh, uh, template. So if possible, uh, the Library and Archives will then be able to get someone who has a specialty in, let's say, a language uh, for a certain end term project. So uh, it's not uncommon for archives institutes to, to ask. Mm -hmm. Thank and you if for I may, it's not, we're, we're, sorry, I was just going to say that it's, it's not necessarily just for, for digital files, right? I remember at, uh, we would have many a conversation about whether it was Saraduk, for instance, should be in a position to say, well, if you want us to take your, your archive, if you want us to take your, your collection, um, it, it would behoove you to provide a little bit of funding for the administration of that. That, that it's time, it's effort, it's hours. In some cases, depending on the size of the archive, it could be it could be months and months and months of work. And the expectation is, you know, people drop these things off like seritke at your door, and the expectation is that you have to you have to make some sense of it all for you know your minimum wage, and that that seems to be wrong. I think sometimes we're afraid to ask. You know, and, and again, I'm not talking the Shuchenko Foundation at this point, but I'm talking from that experience of Osirado. We're afraid to ask, you know, yeah, we're, we're ready to take your archive, but, you know, dish out a little cash to help us administer this in the most rudimentary way. That's right. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, so far, we don't have more questions coming from the audience. Um, is any follow-ups you have... Uh, to share, would like to share with us uh, of what was asked or other points which have come to you. I do have a few more questions which I would have loved to run for you, but I think you probably have as well. I ha can I then go ahead and ask uh, the panelists another question? I don't, I don't see, I don't, okay, then I'll proceed in, because it's hard to see what you're saying. Uh, one of the challenges we face in our work when it comes down to archival work uh, by community organizations is of course the lack of resources, the aging uh, or rather advanced aged of those committed individuals who are working in the archives. We are overwhelmed with the amount of archival material which needs to be preserved. And at the same time, I'm thinking uh, overseas, I'm thinking Ukraine. Uh, over the last, uh, uh, short, over the short while, like 10, 15 years or so, there are a couple of uh, very interesting initiatives developed in Ukraine under the government um, guidance. More specifically, I'm talking about the archive known as, I think its full name would be National Ukrainian Archives of Foreign Ukrainica. Uh, I have worked in this archives on a couple of my own projects and I've been quite impressed with what it has to offer and the level of professionalism which is in, being displayed in, by the work. And what struck me is that uh, they, they face a different problem. They have many employees, very many archivists who are highly trained and they're still building their collection. So with this preamble, I'm just wondering if uh, Such and uh, uh, archival committee at UCC and Shevchenko Foundation have ever thought about liaisoning or, or at least exploring some potential routes of collaboration with those archives in Ukraine, which are, are quite hungry for, for archival materials themselves. I'll, I'll take the first stab at it. I think so long as 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 their interest is and and our interests are 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 you know not subjected to to, to just you know the interests of Ukraine at all, but that that we're speaking about you know Ukrainian Canadiana, um, and if 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 the communities the archival communities want to to create a joint project a joint collaboration, then I think that that is something that that the Shoshenko Foundation could certainly look at, you know, the, there has to be that, again, as I said earlier, there has to be that Canadian connection, there has to be that Canadian component. Um, if they're hungry for, for archives and we're hungry for expertise, uh, seems to me like, 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 like something should be, something should happen here. 
that's what I was hoping to hear because again, it's a very different problem in Ukraine. There's very many trained people because they're building the archives, specifically in this particular archives of Diasporiana. Uh, it's, a, it's a national archives. Uh, Marina and Andriu, have, have you ever gone that route or? Well, well, one thing about, the sorry, Marina. No, go ahead. About, uh, the, a small project that uh, I'm working with Meron Momorek on this here. He's retired, of course, but always busy. Uh, he, uh, actually right now, uh, the Orthodox Church here in Ottawa has thousands of books laid on boxes uh, and tables throughout, which were just donated to the church there from of course, uh, you know, people pass away and the children don't want these books. And they're valuable books, all sorts of Ukrainian uh, published books, uh, pre-communist, um, during uh, communist times, and of course, uh, Brazilian, British, German, French uh, published books, all on Ukraine. And uh, Meron and I and a few other uh, volunteers, what we're doing is we're uh, trying to figure out what to do with these books. So, for example, if someone wants to grab some for their own interest, they can, because these will be going in the garbage, unfortunately. Uh, there is also, I believe, some digitization programs in Ukraine available. So I'm just talking with books and, of course, the, the LPs with the Museum of Diaspora in Kiev. It's part of the Kiev City uh, Museum. Uh, and uh, uh, with, with that, hopefully we can help out and... Uh, pass on more of that knowledge which Ukraine doesn't have. Uh, now, one thing about Ukrainian Canadian archives, we're very different uh, than, let's say, Italian or uh, German, because there was, of course, you know, uh, Ukraine Canadians or Ukrainian British, they had their own way of uh, saving Ukrainian history because of course it was being ruined during the communist times. So now Ukraine is uh, able to take on that, uh, that task. But unfortunately, as you say, there, there, is no, um, there are no finances for this. So I'm not sure what the answer is for this. Uh, Marina, please. Thank you. Um, I personally don't think that we should just send everything to Ukraine. Well, I, I, yeah, for, yeah I, I know this is not what you're saying. I think we're, I think we're all in agreement on that one. <laughs> because maybe because I lived there long enough to know that uh, if you come to an archives, not as a professor from Canada, but as a mortal being, the service is, and I may, I don't know this particular one, Natalia, that you mentioned, but just a regular Oblastny Archiv, if you're not a big shishka, they do not serve you well. You have to beg for opposite to then get the actual materials. It takes, and you arrive for a week or two and it takes months sometimes to wait or people do it as a favor to you. And here in Canada, working with the information professionals, I'm so used to people being so helpful, so trying to help you, so trying to give you more, just please use it. So I, I'm not sure. I hope there will be, and political situation in Ukraine is such that I'm not sure I, I trust, I don't know. Sure. Maybe in the future there will be more, and there should be more collaboration. There should be more collaborative work. But I think Ukrainian Canadians, it's not like we are dying out and we just have to preserve history about us. I think Ukrainian Canadian communities are thriving. They're changing, but they're here and well. So I think it's our responsibility first and foremost, but I know that, for example, Miron Momrik and some other people believe that uh, sending, sharing some of the resources is a good idea. So I guess not. Thank you. And resources could be understood differently. There are also human resources and human yes. expertise. Absolutely. But I was specifically people. talking about archives as material resources. Yeah, it's a, it's a matter of a dialogue and it's something to come back to. We are uh, unfortunately running out of time, but I wanted to take liberty again to briefly summarize what, well, not, not summarize, but to reflect briefly on what we were trying to accomplish with this particular panel. We uh, have a panel titled Community Archiving Where to Go to Help. As you, if you're still with us, you have noticed that we have uh, talked to representatives of most powerful organizations in, in Canada, be 
uh, and individuals who are sharing several chairs, representing community organizations and also uh, working professionally as archivists in various uh, um, archives, such as Bogdan Nowitzki Ukrainian Folklore Archives and, and Library um, and Archives Canada. So the point is that there are those organizations to go directly for help. I also appreciated uh, the potential uh, next development, which might be happening, Marina will follow up on that uh, uh, in terms of having further dialogue between Shevchenko Foundation and the Archival Committee, UCC and SUCH, on, um, uh, on, on how to improve the work and, and networking. And uh, I understand, Marina, you will be, uh, while representing Such and, and Bogdan Nabisky Ukrainian Folk Archive, you will be moving on with next initiatives under the same umbrella. And uh, so I will therefore give you an opportunity to wrap up the event uh, because we're coming to that point. <laughs> it's about 1.30. Thank you, Natalia. Um, thank you all. I was really looking forward to this day and uh, I, I enjoyed it greatly. I hope it was useful for you as well. Uh, the Cool Folklore Center will continue organizing events uh, within the Sustainable Ukraine Canadian Heritage Project. We would like to hear from you. We would like to hear, especially from smaller community organizations, about your needs, about your specific needs, what exactly you need help with, what are your questions, and uh, Romado, you we are Sela, you know, we, we can do a lot if we uh, join our efforts together. We do bring in different types of expertise to the table, I believe, and different types of resources. So I think we can make it success. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming. And uh, check out the resources. We will follow up with all the attendees with the the questions that were not answered uh, or resources that we promised to share and uh, with a, a short survey. So thank you very much for attending. And thank, thank you, Verena, for organizing this fantastic event for all of us stuck here at home. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. All right, at this very note, I guess because I have the power of a moderator here, I would thank everybody for your participation and for your questions. You know how to reach, to reach Marina. Uh, please, uh, if, you have, if you have further questions, shoot them uh, our way or Marina's way more specifically. Uh, I know Marina's promised uh, that the, the follow-ups will be there, so your questions will be addressed and answered if we somehow failed to maybe uh, notice them coming in here. Thank you very much yet again and have a lovely afternoon or the evening depending where you are. Thank you.